Good day, liberators. I am delighted to announce that on Thursday, the 19th of September 2024, our application for leave to appeal, the earlier judgment in August uh, dismissing our application against the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority to provide us with uh, the full unredacted uh, record of the uh, vaccines that they have registered for COVID-19. And um, the High Court dismissed that, uh, Justice Lenai, uh, during August, and she even uh, gave a punitive cost order against Liberty Fighters Network and myself. And um, now on Thursday, uh, under very strange circumstances, we were notified only on Wednesday that the hearing is going to take place on, on the next day, Thursday after we filed our application for leave to appeal. And, um, and yeah, so I was initially, I thought that, you know what, this is just another kick it to the sideline. And I've decided, you know what, go for it, Dano. Um, miracles are always happening, in, in, in especially the work that we are doing. And why can this not a miracle happen in this particular case as well? So I've quickly prepared, I've indicated I'm ready for the next day. And, you know, when you're going to watch the hearing, the full hearing that, that's going to follow this short um, introduction, you will see that I've went for it and that the legal practitioners on the side of SAPRA was totally shocked. They, Mr. Mr. Advocate Berger, uh, who appeared on behalf of SAPRA, um, he was clearly, uh, when he started to argue his, his case, he was shocked after what he has heard from my side. And this is typically a situation whereby the legal fraternity, and remember <clears throat> that, that, as I've reported before, that when, when the application to obtain the full unredacted record um, was heard, I, I, was, I was the only one in court, uh, and I'm a lay litigant, self-represented lay litigant. And I appeared against two advocates and five attorneys on the side of SAPRA. So uh, this time, I just went for it. And this self-entitlement of the legal fraternity over our courts must come to an end. And that is a key issue that we are attacking. And this will also be part, as you will hear, from, um, that's going to proceed before the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, let me just quickly give a background. On June, during June 2022, we've lodged an application to review and set aside the decisions pertaining to all COVID-19 vaccines registered by SAPRA, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. And uh, that case has, has gone on. And uh, initially, although the application was properly served by the sheriff, SAPRA did not come forward and oppose the matter. So I then, because we needed the record uh, of, of, of all the decisions of the registration, I've then filed a so-called Rule 30A to uh, 30A1 notice um, to, comp to, to request that, that they have violated, or yes, the rules, not to provide the record, and they need to provide it within 10 days. So um, they eventually, I was at the point they, they've ignored it, and um, I've proceeded to enroll the matter then as unopposed, and then they came forward producing the record. I've withdrawn the, the unopposed matter of the review application, and then we've started to battle about the content of the record because the record, the, the more than 500 pages that they've provided of all, all the, um, there were about five, I, I believe, um, so-called vaccines that were registered under very strange circumstances. Um, from the 500 pages that they've provided, about half of it were blacked out. So and they claim that it's for confidentiality and privacy of the pharmaceutical companies. So then we've lodged an application to compel them to produce the full unredacted record. And that application was then dismissed with punitive costs, as I've indicated during August. So this, what's going to follow is the full application for leave to appeal that was heard virtually on MS Teams on uh, Thursday, the 19th of August, 2024. And just note that, um, that you will see that I've, unfortunately I had some technical problems on my side when I've recorded uh, the, the entire matter that um, somehow my video just went blank on my side. 
uh, although the judge and the others could see me, but um, unfortunately, um, the, the total recording was just black where my, my, my video was or my um, presentation was. And so what I've just did on this to just make it more, more relevant or uh, f uh, complete, I've just put a, a, a photograph of me arguing there. So you will see that I'm not moving and it's it's because it's a it's just a photo a placeholder that i've put there um, to, to make it relevant um, i have requested the official recording which i will obviously make available once i receive it uh, which would be the official uh, recording of of that application and um, yeah continue enjoy leave leave your your comments about this matter um, down beneath and I, I, I truly believe that you're going to enjoy this. Until the next time, God bless. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Dibir. Good morning, Mr. Berger. Good morning, Judge. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. I was having issues with my laptops. Uh, you always excused? Judge, can I the matter? Yes, please, Yugani. Following the matter of Liberty Fighters Network and Tibir versus Sapra, case number 30280 of 2022. Thank you. You may proceed, um, Mr. De Beer. You yes, are on mute. I am Mr. Rainer De Beer. You are muted, Mr. De Beer. Uh, pardon. Uh, I am Rainer De Beer. Um, I am the second applicant uh, in the matter and also the officer of the uh, first applicant in this matter. Um, you, may I you. proceed, or do you want Mr. Berger to first introduce himself? Thank you, Mr. DeBier. Mr. Berger, if you can place your, yourself on record. Thank you, my lady. Jonathan Berger from the Johannesburg Bar for the respondent. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Mr. DeBier, you may proceed. Uh, thank you very much. The, this is an application uh, for leave to appeal that was lodged um, at the end of August in relation to the uh, Rule 30A application proceedings that took place before um, you, Madam Justice. Um, to, to, to just start off and, and put on record that although I am fully prepared for this hearing and do not mind to proceed, uh, I must record that it is a bit uncommon for um, parties to be notified a day before the hearing of uh, this type of application and not requesting heads of argument. Um, because my concern is that I'm going to raise several several points um, points um, uh, of authority uh, which have to be recorded in some way. And I can't expect um, you, Madam Justice, to um, to have all of them at hand and, and scribble them down all the time. So I am going can to proceed and can I, just ask, can I just ask, Mr. DPR, you did not have an opportunity to prepare your heads of arguments. Is um, that what you are telling the court? Madam Justice, um, it is a practice as I understand uh, from this court that usually it is required for all hearings to, to, to prepare heads of argument at least and um, unfortunately we were notified yesterday of, of, this, meet, uh, of, of this hearing and yes we, we have not had the opportunity to, 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 to file extensive heads of, of argument and if my lady would not mind to proceed and um, then constantly have to scribble down all the um, the authority I'm going to reference to, 
then I do not mind and um, and I would proceed. Um, uh, I was I hear what you're saying, Mr. Dibir. Uh Normally, when people make application for leave to appeal, they also prepare their heads of argument. I was under the impression that that was done, but seeing that that was not done, then this might not be the opportune time to proceed with the matter. Let me hear Mr. Berger. Thank you, my lady. Uh, my lady, we, we were given the opportunity yesterday to raise any objection to, to this hearing. Um, I agree that it was, we were notified, given short notice, but all of us agreed to proceed. Um, we too haven't prepared heads of argument, um, but but we do not believe that this matter, that, that the heads are required for this matter, and we're quite happy for the matter to, to proceed. Um, the opportunity, the opportunity to to raise this concern would have been, should have been taken yesterday, um, not at the start of the hearing today. Thank you, Mr. Berger. I mean, this is Mr. Berger. Mr. De Beer, um if you are happy to proceed, the court does not have a problem to proceed. I will scribble as much as I can, and um, just so that uh, we don't delay. Uh, we don't delay these proceedings. If you are comfortable, if you are not comfortable, I'm prepared to postpone. Mm. Uh, Madam Justice, as I've indicated um, in the beginning when I've raised the issue, I am fully prepared. Um, it would, I am going to refer to, uh, to specific authority. And if um, Madam Justice will not mind, if I can upload those authorities uh, to case Mr. lines. Dear, Mr. Dear, can I just ask that we adjourn a little bit? There's a little bit of noise. As, as the court pleases. Thank you, Mr. Dear. We may proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Justice. My camera just went off for some reason um, when we've... Can, can everyone hear me? We can hear you and we can also see you, Mr. Dibia. Um If that's the case, then there's no, no, no problem. Um, Madam Justice, I've asked, um, just before you uh, quickly adjourned, whether the... Um, whether it would be acceptable for you if I upload the the, the additional um, cases that I'm going to refer to an authority just on, on case lines after the the, the, the year. Yes. On. No, the court will be indebted to you, Mr. De Pierre. Thank you. Uh, as as the court pleases. Um, yes, uh, this is an application for leave to appeal, and um, I do refer to the judgment itself or. Um, in order to uh, firstly let me address um, it, it, it would be apt to just quickly go through the application for leave to appeal itself um, I've indicated that th we have um, that this application is brought based on the grounds that another court would reasonably come to a different conclusion and or an appeal would have a reasonable prospect of a su success and or there is some other compelling reason why the appeal should be heard and respectfully find inter alia that Linyai, uh, Judge Linyai has erred on one or more of the following grounds as set out in front to be further argued at the year. Um, now, before I, I, I further proceed, there are basically four um, aspects which are key to granting leave to appeal. The first one is the issue of the representation. Uh, the second one is uh, the issue of non-joinder. The third one is the uh, apparent non-compliance to Rule 50A, and then the fourth aspect is the issue of costs. Now, um, let me start off with the first one, the representation. Um, Madam Justice, you have um, extensively addressed um, the issue of um, representation in your um, in your uh, judgment, and uh, specifically. I start off with, there are 
certain, certain uh, there are actually several uh, um, arguments that the applicants have presented in favor and in support of the representation confirmation that was requested that, uh, that has not been included in the judgment. Now, the first aspect is, uh, I go to paragraph 6 of the judgment, whereby the applicants rely on the matters of Kenya CC, uh, I'm just going to abbreviate, and Dove's group um, matters, where the court allowed Mr. De Beer to represent the first applicant as its official. Now, the, the key aspect here in this Kenya case specifically is the fact that this matter was in fact a matter which was later, later pursued up to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court then made a determination that there was no compelling reason to, uh, to decide uh, otherwise. Um, so the court would have definitely, if, if the Constitutional Court had an issue with the approach of, of um, uh, Justice Modiba in that specific matter, uh, how she allowed me to also represent other natural peer, uh, persons. Um, and there was no pre application to, um, to, to say that I cannot or I should have addressed uh, the or I should have made application in terms of the so-called Manon matter um, to first get permission to draft and uh, later appear um, on behalf of Liberty Fighters Network which is a, a juristic persona. Um, th that specific case confirms that that such authority by or uh, the court does have the authority to allow a non-legal practitioner to represent another entity. And um, I would like to uh, specifically refer the court to um, the aspect also which was not mentioned in the judgment at all. Section 33 of the Legal Practice Act. Now, Section 33 of the Legal Practice Act stipulates, and I, I just quickly refer to Section 31.1 of, uh, uh, of the Legal Practice Act, says that subject to any other law, no person other than a practicing legal practitioner who has been admitted and enrolled as such in terms of this Act may, in expectation of any fee, commission, gain or re reward, appear in any court of law, and then I, I just abbreviate, and then also be, draw up or execute any instruments or documents. Um, now, in that particular uh, matter, it is evident that the key thing that the court must uh, adjudicate there is that there must be an expectation of, of a benefit for a party um, to hold himself out then as a legal practitioner and then may not. So the moment how that is interpreted and if you read it carefully, it essentially says that if you are someone who is not expecting any benefit of whatsoever nature, you may then represent another entity or person and also pre prepare those documents before court. The Manon judgment was way back in 2009 when the Legal Practice Act was not in operation. And my interpretation of the Legal Practice Act specifically is also confirmed by, and I refer you to, um, uh, let me first say that, that the Constitution itself stipulates that we've got one, South Africa, the Republic has got one unified court system. So all the courts are, has got exactly the same same basis, yes, they, they are the superior courts and the lower courts, but at the end of the day, we've got one unified court system. Now, in terms of, of, of that, um, I refer the court then to, um, to rule the, the magistrate court rules, and specifically rule 52, relating to representation. And I just want to note that rule 52, regarding representation, was totally substituted by Rule 4 of um, General Notice um, R1318 of 2018. So that was after the, um, the commencement of the Legal Practice Act. So when they have inserted, the Rules Board have insert, uh, substituted that entire rule, they have specifically had to have taken 
uh, section 33.1 into consideration. And interesting of rule uh, of rule 52 is the following, and why I mentioned that is that um, rule 52.1b of the uh, magistrate's court uh, rules stipulate that a local authority, company, or other incorporated entity in doing so may act through an officer thereof authorized by it for that purpose, and then see a partnership, association, body corporate, or any other group of persons associated for a common purpose may act through a member thereof authorized by it for that purpose. So, I am basically arguing to say that why would the rules board, after the commencement of section 33 of the Legal Practice Act specifically, have put this in there if an officer um, automatically, uh, let, let's say for example, I'm going to, 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 to make an example that um, a company's director, according to those rules, may represent the company, but he is receiving an income, um, at least the director's remuneration. Um, then there's also a reference to a partner. Partnership is not even a, ju a, a juristic entity, but a partner in that partnership is given the authority, in terms of those rules, to represent the partnership. So, uh, in the same sense, unfortunately, the, the High Court, the Uniform Rules of Court, does not make, do not make provision specifically for representation. The interpretation in terms of uh, the representation of a, a, a juristic entity like Liberty Fighters Network is still governed by prefer mainly the argument presented in the Manon case, which was in 2009 way before Section 33.1 was implemented. Um, and then I would like to refer the court to an unreported case that took place, uh, that, that uh, was um, in this very court, um, Gauteng Division Pretoria. I'm going to cite it and I will upload this specific case. Uh, it's Armour Technology Systems PTY LTD versus DCD Dash Group Limited, PTY LTD, and others. Case 31884 of 2015, um, High Court, Gauteng Division, Pretoria. Judgment was rendered on the 21st of October 2015. It's unreported, and the presiding judge was Judge Janssen van Nieuwenhuizen. Now, why I refer to this case is that, interestingly, the in that matter, the applicant. Um, or the, respo the, 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 the respondents, the first respondent, Armour Technology Systems Limited in the main application, was represented from the beginning by its director, uh, one Mr. Van Yerden. Now, Mr. Van Yerden was considered to be the alter ego of that entity. And um, this matter apparently came first before uh, Justice Stormay, and she was the one, in terms of the judgment that, in that very judgment, was the one to say that Mr. Van Yerden must first bring a representation application in order to represent his, his, um, his company. So Mr. Van Yerden did do that. And um, as, as I've indicated, the alter ego of the company. And then subsequently, um, when this matter, that uh, application was considered and heard before Justice um, Justice Janssen van Nieuwenhuizen, she came to the respectfully said strange conclusion that she did not grant Mr. van Heerden the right to represent his own, um, own entity. And what was strange about this, this entire case is that Mr. Mr. Um, Van Yerden was never granted the right to represent his own company, notwithstanding that he was the alter ego of it. In terms of a joinder application that was brought by the applicants, or, or the, the initial main, main application applicant and the respondent in that matter, um, it was said that um, Mr. Mr. Van Yerden had to be joined because he was basically the alter ego of the company for purposes of a cost order against him. So, so in the one way, in this judgment specifically, the court took away, uh, took away his op opportunity to represent his own entity 
without actually citing any specific reasons, although the judgment mentioned that there was an extempore judgment given at that point in time, which we could not find. Um, she did go on and and cite him as a and joined him as an entity because he was the alter ego. So that matter did go on appeal, and strangely, um, on appeal, application for leave to appeal in that specific matter, um, also came before Justice um, uh, Justice Nivenhuisen, and I I quote the the reference to the case. It's Armor Technology Systems Pty Ltd and another versus DCD Group Limited, PTY LTD and others, case 31884 stroke 2015, High Court Gauteng Division Pretoria, 20 March 2019, unreported before Justice Van Nieuwenhuisen. And in that specific case, she starts off in paragraph 2 of the judgment, that at the inception of the hearing, I granted the following orders in terms of an application incidental to application for leave to appeal brought by the applicant. So the, and the order was that the first applicant is granted the right to be represented by the second applicant. So in this case, Justice Van Nieuwenhuisen did grant Mr. Van Heerden the right to represent his, his company. And then secondly, she also went further to grant, the second applicant is granted the right to be assisted by a non-legal practitioner in the presentation of the applicant's case. Now, now, what is strange about this, this and why I mention it, is that, that there appears to be a total, a massive problem in the courts today to understand why one judge allows an entity to be represented, the magistrate's court allows it, but then suddenly, in some instances, judges say that an entity, notwithstanding that that entity is, is represented by a so-called alter ego of that entity, may not be, be represented like exactly happened in this matter. That aspect alone, Madam Justice, is definitely in the interest of the public to clarify and get a final uh, adjudication on the right of representation of, in this specific case, of entities, uh, um, juristic entities. Um, I am fully of the, uh, of, of the opinion that uh, the implementation of the Legal Practice Act changed the whole scenario because of that even it appears that the magistrate's court rules have been uh, changed to accommodate that specifically irrespective that the director or partner may receive an actual salary or income of that entity, which would then be considered as a, as a benefit. But I believe that uh, Section 33.1 of, uh, of the Legal Practice Act specifically indicates that it doesn't want, what it tries to prevent is that every Tom, Dick and Larry cannot go out and assume or, or say that he or she is a legal practitioner and start earning money for that representation um, and, and then that is totally, that can be understandable and that is how it should be interpreted but uh, 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 legislation like for example the Equality Act the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act specifically makes provision that any party any person may represent anyone before that court. Yes, it has been made and, and, and crafted to accommodate the people on grassroots level. But surely the, um, the, 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 the legislator would have taken into consideration that uh, the key aspect there is that anyone may be assisted, but that person cannot come out and then start earning money as a re formal representative of parties in front of the Equality Court. So in this very sense is that I believe that the Manon judgment and the fact that the 10-year judgment has subsequently gone to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court basically said that there is no prospect of success and the judgment stays as it is. Would there have been a problem, the Constitutional Court would have raised that to say that it's not allowed to allow an individual to represent someone else. So I hope that that has put a lid on our argument pertaining to the, to the legal representation. Why is it important 
to take it on appeal because our main application specifically refer originally to uh, granting or confirming that I've got the right to also represent Liberty Fighters Network and now your ruling Madam Justice would have the effect that whoever is going to hear the main application is obliged to follow your ruling as well. So our main application has got um, a problem not to be able to proceed on that basis. So in that respect, your judgment is then final in effect and then appealable for that one aspect. Then let me address the second aspect of non-joinder. Madam Justice, it is um, in in the application, um, let me just go to the record. In the uh, in your judgment, yeah, sorry. On uh, paragraph two of your judgment, uh, in the Rule 30A application, you have stated the parties had agreed in the joint practice note dated 14 December 2023 that the common cause issues are as follows. And I go to point 2.2 two specifically, the it cited that, and this is according to the court cite, uh, uh, recorded in the joint practice note that at paragraph 2.2, the holders of the registration certificates in respect of the COVID-19 vaccines that are the subject of this application, as well as the main application, have not been cited as respondents in both applications. I reflect, uh, respectfully find it um, find it strange that the court has not cited what actually was referenced in that particular paragraph and I read from the re uh, from what is um, uh, what has been um, uploaded and the joint practice note uh, to be found at um, let me just I've got the record joint uh, and that specific one can be found at um, 0 to 1 stroke 1 that is the joint practice note and then <coughs> um, I go to the common cause facts found on uh, 0 to 1 dash 5 it's the practice notes uh, number 5 paragraph 5 and five point, paragraph 5.3 in fact records and this is what both parties have agreed and accepted is that paragraph 5.3 says that although they have been made aware of this interlocutory and the main review application the holders of registration certificates in respect of the as per applicants claim COVID-19 vaccines that are the subject of the main application have not been cited as respondents in either application so the court has not recorded in its judgment that the pharmaceutical companies claim to be interested uh, parties that they have been notified not only by the applicants but also by SAPRA themselves who have communicated that fact with them now why is this relevant that they have been notified of these proceedings before the court because there is a full court judgment in the free state and that I'm going to refer to where a similar situation occurred and the fact that it's a full court I respectfully say that this court which have sat as one single judge is obliged to through the uh, doctrine of state decasis to follow the ruling of two judges in this specific matter and in this case and this I will also upload this to case lines it's in the case of Lawrence versus Magistrates Commission and others, um, close bracket, or, uh, open bracket 1070 uh, forward slash 2019, close bracket, and then in uh, square brackets 2019, uh, ZA FSHC 269, and it also goes on at 2020, uh, uh, 2 SA 526FB 12 December 2019. Now, in this specific matter, um, paragraph um, 24 of that judgment uh, reads as follows. Applicants served his amended notice of motion dated 28th of June 2019 together with his supplementary founding affidavit by email on all candidates shortlisted for the vacant position in Bloemfontein, Petersburg and Botschabelle.
He invited them to join the proceedings, notwithstanding his belief that they did not have a direct and substantial interest in the review application. Just in that one paragraph, that is exactly what I did, and the applicants did. We did not believe that the pharmaceutical companies would have a direct interest because the decision was made by SAPRA itself. And notwithstanding, we've served the, the, the applications on them, they have been included in the communication, the proof of, of sending it to them um, have also been attached, and they have chosen not to be part of it. And this is where it comes in, in that judgment further. In response to your respondents' non-joined the plea, there the state has also said, but oh, they have not been joined and this makes it, makes it null and void. But paragraph 52 says, in response to your respondents' non-joined the plea, applicant explains how he gave notice of the application and attaches proof of service. He did this although the committee decided to play cat and mouse insofar as he declined to advise him with candidates had been recommended for appointment. The state attorney instructed by respondents relied on so-called confidentiality. Madam Justice, does that not sound familiar? Because in this very aspect, SAPRA has also claimed that there is confidentiality and that is why they have not not presented us with a with full record, etc., etc. But the court goes on in that specific instance, paragraph 26. In my view, all shortlisted candidates knew about the applicant's application and if anyone wanted to oppose, he she would have been able to do so. They are all legally, in this aspect, they are all legally qualified people who can obtain that they were ill-informed of their rights. Madam Justice, they are, the pharmaceutical companies are major corporations, not only in South Africa, but in the entire world. Surely, when they receive important documentation and invitations to join, if they want to, proceedings before court, they will definitely go to their legal advisors to advise them on that issue and get clarity whether they should or should not. In this very instance, they knew all the way. And how do we know that they were actually part of these proceedings all the time in the background where SAPRA has not uh, informed the school that that was in fact the case? It is because of the record that the redacted record that was actually produced. When one goes to the redacted record, how did SAPRA know which parts are confidential and private and which parts are not? The only way in which SAPRA could have done that was if the pharmaceutical companies knew about that and informed SAPRA which parts are confidential and private. Isn't that a logical conclusion? The further point is that, that um, which is Otherwise, if that is not the case, which is bad, because it, it means that they have always known and, and, and were bored and, and backing SAPRA in this matter, if it's interpreted and, and accepted in that way. Otherwise, we have a second problem, if it's not the case. Then it means that SAPRA has taken it upon itself, making it then biased and not to be independent, and chose on behalf of the pharmaceutical companies which parts are confidential and which parts are not. So in that sense further, Madam Justice, the problem we are sitting with is that when you go to the record, that the redacted record, in that same way I can ask on, on various pages, why is this specific thing not being confidential and, and why did you choose those parts to be redacted. The problem is further, Madam Justice, that SAPRA has not explained in any way why each and every one of those parts that were redacted would, is required to be redacted. It did not even take this very court in its confidence to say that in camera, let us open uh, unredacted let the court see whether those are relevant parts to be redacted or not, and let the court make the decision which parts should be then scratched out. That was never done. And that is why I've also referred the court to uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal um, matter. I know uh, uh, it's, it's the matter of, of um, uh, Justice Spooner, 
um, appeal uh, judge of appeal where he has basically scrutinized the aspect of secrecy it's not all on, on to the parties to declare which parts are confidential and and secret it's for the court to make that decision not for the for the party presenting the report so that is a, a key aspect that we know that they were part um, the issue of rejoinder why is it important to have the doctrine of non-joinder the doctrine of non-joinder the purpose of it is to ensure that there are not any court proceedings against which would affect another party which they are not aware of in this very instance they were well right aware of it and then the other aspect is that i've referred to another case where the, this very court granted in an, uh, um, the um, the irrespective of the fact that the pharmaceutical companies have not been cited uh, at all in in that that case um, the court in any event considered the rights of the pharmaceutical companies and irrespective of that the court found that it was uh, the, the the public's right to have access to those proceedings uh, and to those documentation outweighs the rights of the pharmaceutical companies and that is why irrespective of them not even knowing apparently of those proceedings the court uh, uh, granted an order that those contracts those supply contracts had to be made public the supply contracts and uh, we know now through part of the record of Pfizer that was uh, submitted that um, the, when, when Sapra wrote to them to say that these proceedings are here and whether you agree to, uh, to confidential and, and private information to be revealed um, which was not explained um, the, the, the Pfizer's um, representative I believe it was Mr. Pillay or Naidu came and, and he responded to say oh, I remember that there is the, this contract between us and the government which ensures that there is secrecy or or confidentiality about the whole issue irrespective of that the court in that other matter granted that order so uh, the issue of non-joinder should never have been an issue um, and then um, let me go to the, th the the third point the rule 30a application or the notice that apparently has not been complied with madam justice the respondent the respondents legal uh, practitioners have put this court unfortunately on a wild goose chase in that respect and i'm going to say why um in that in the judgment um it is oh yes in paragraph 43 of the judgment Sapra submits that not only was the notice issued for a different purpose but it was followed by the initiation of proceedings in terms of rule 30A2 that was sub subsequently abandoned at the hearing I, I could not understand Mr. Berger's argument in that respect and I think my, uh, uh, Madam Justice you would remember that you also asked me a couple of times but mr why did this happen and and i couldn't understand now when the judgment came out it was that the 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 the, the legal practitioners of the um of, of sapra made the court to believe and and i i believe that it was definitely intentional it could not be otherwise that there was another previous rule 50a application that was never the case the application what happened was that and on case lines it can be clarified that the main application was at a point because Sapra did not oppose the matter at all a rule 30 a one notice was given uh, to Sapra to say that you have not defended opposed the matter and you have not produced your the record of the proceedings and we expect you to rectify it um, and uh, otherwise we are going to proceed with with um, and in that respect they were well aware of the fact that we are then going to move the main application as unopposed so 
we are in road the matter the mail application in that matter because it was not properly opposed and then Sapra came and opposed it and submitted the record so there was no need so and the record that they were uh, produced was redacted so I then communicated with them to say but you uh, go, um, gents uh, this cannot be happening you, you cannot redact it and expect that it's a full record please comply otherwise I need to bring a rule 30 a application which is this very one under appeal so the fact that they did not comply to unredact it they did not even unredact certain ones and then presented me with with a more clearer record they just kept it unredacted so based on that that original still active rule I merely as a gentleman informed them that you still have not complied in the way the judgment is currently read and understood is that the court expects that every time when a record is produced and it's only part then you need to give them a rule 30 a notice of non-compliance then the, the party presents another bit and then we must issue another rule 30 a, a notice and then they come forward with another bit then we must I don't think the Rule 58 should be interpreted at all in that way. Rule 53 specifically talks about a record must be produced. It doesn't refer to if part of the record or a redacted record. It refers to the record must be produced. So it means that the full record must be produced. Not as they want part of it. So they have not complied to that specific um, uh, 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 notice. And by me a gentleman I've informed them that I'm going to if you don't give it I will proceed and that is exactly what I did there was no other Rule 30A application before this court so the intention of and I go to that specific part that um, paragraph 46 I have noted that the applicants have not meaningfully responded to the submissions by SAPRA that they are relying on an abandoned notice which cannot be relied upon in these fresh proceedings there were no other proceedings but these proceedings Madam Justice all they are saying is that they have not served the notice so we constantly that is what I've argued in the court that we have complied what is the problem and then paragraph 47 in my view taking into consideration that the initial rule 30A notice was abandoned the applicants needed to have resuscitated the abandoned proceedings or served a fresh Rule 30A1 notice. Having not done so, the Rule 30A2 application cannot be sustained. That one paragraph in your judgment, Madam Justice, implies that you were made to believe that there was another application that was abandoned. That was the argument presented by the legal practitioners while well knowing that that was not the case. They have put this court on a wild goose chase, resulting in this court coming to such a strange conclusion, respectfully said. Then the aspects of cost. Madam Justice, um, it is well known that Liberty Fighters Network is a voluntary association without gain, assisting the people of South Africa to be legally empowered. Where the legal practitioners fail to assist, the people on grassroots level, they come to us as a last resort to come and help them in person and we help them. Now, this judgment, because this court was of the view, respectfully said, that there was non joinder, which I have now indicated in that judgment, as long as the other parties were invited to the party and they never, never came, that non joinder cannot be relied on. And, but because we did not join them, and because I've indicated now that, but they have been, they should have been part of these proceedings from the word go, because otherwise they could not have told the SAPRA which parts to redact. Um, you have granted a punitive cost order against our association and myself. Um, Madam Justice, I know that, that costs are in the discretion of the court, and I totally respect that. But in this instance, because this goes to the constitutional concerns of the people of South Africa, the Bio Watch 
uh, concept should have applied. And that is exactly what Justice Davis did in the case of COVID care. Um, I refer to the case of COVID care alliance, NPC and others, versus President of the Republic of South Africa and others, um, that is double, triple zero one four nine of 2023, uh, 2024 Z, uh, um, uh, Gauteng Provincial um, Division, uh, Pretoria, 29 February 2024, I will upload this as well. This is the one where SAPRA was also involved in and it's the specific same legal team that represented SAPRA in that matter. I never knew about that case. I was only after the judgment was, uh, after, after the hearing, I was made aware of, of the existence of this crucial case. Madam Justice, again, the legal practitioners of the uh, uh, of SAPRA. In terms of the own code of conduct, they are compelled to inform the court as officers of the court of any other case they are aware of that might influence the outcome of the particular case before the, the court at that point in time. They well known that those, that specific application was also an application to declare or to uh, uh, get or obtain an order for the for the uh, registered COVID-19 vaccines to be stopped. Um, and similar arguments have been advanced than, than in our case, but the key thing there is also the aspect of the joinder. In that case, Justice Davis specifically said that, the, and that was actually why the case did not fly, was that there was no non-joinder of the pharmaceutical companies. And this court and I have been made aware of, I was ambushed differently by the legal practitioners. If they would have said that they were involved in this specific case, which there was a judgment in February already by Justice Davis, knowing well when I would have received that judgment, and read that there was an issue with a non-joinder. And I know that single judges are supposed to also follow the judgments of other single judges unless there is a crucial a mistake made. So, Madam Justice, by not, they have literally run around the bush in this court, while literally wasting time of the court to argue the non-joinder, where they could have gone to this one case immediately to have said that Justice Davis has already declared that non-joinder of the pharmaceutical companies under these similar circumstances are essential. They did not. They chose to ignore. They didn't want this court and myself to know about that case. In that case, there are crucial matters of concern which I could have also raised in argument when I appeared before Madam Justice. And it was not. They were compelled to have notified the court about that case. So unfortunately, we are sitting with, um, it, I believe that the cost order, respectfully, was, was not the correct decision under these circumstances. And to summarize, and, and uh, if I, I did submit the heads of argument, um, Justice, um, uh, Madam Justice, you would have maybe figured that this is not or the, this is not going to be an ordinary session of application for leave to appeal um, for introducing all these new arguments that uh, pertain to the matter. Um, I do believe that we have got a very decent uh, and definitely in the interest of justice to determine various of these key matters on appeal. Let the matter be referred to the Supreme Court of Appeal and let the Supreme Court of Appeal deal with these critical issues. It appears respectfully that every time when the word or the phrase COVID-19 is challenged in our courts, and I'm talking out of experience, there are numerous of, of, of our COVID-19 challenges on uh, uh, reported. Every time, and specifically, um, the fact that 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 uh, like in the Just, Justice Davis, uh, Justice Davis coincidentally was also the one who was um, the presiding judge in at least three or four of our reported cases about COVID-19. So for him to have gone out of his way to then address the cost in, in paragraph 102, 
he explained in detail from paragraph 102 up to paragraph 106 why a normal cost order would have been justified against the applicants in that specific matter because they have taken that they have kept the court busy with with processes which were totally uncommon and uncalled for um, and he then addressed the bar watch to say that normally the bar watch principle would have applied but under those circumstances seeing what the applicants did and their legal practitioner um, justify the normal cost order however in our case you have summarized with respect madam justice in paragraph um, in one single paragraph basically that um, punitive costs are deserved against both applicants uh, I respectfully say that that you were wrong but I, I also want to say on the other side I believe that that the fact that that the legal practitioner is basically um, uh, put the court and ourselves on a wild goose chase and unfortunately the court was also not aware of the the, the two judge judgment in the free state uh, relating to the non-joinder um, Madam Justice I believe that it's uh, we do have a, a, a prospect of of success on appeal I do believe that it's definitely in the interest of justice to refer this matter on appeal preferably to the Supreme Court of Appeal to address these important aspects and uh, but it's alternatively for the court to make a judgment that it finds is in the interest of justice um, unless Madam Justice has got any specific questions for me um, I arrest our our um, um, matter and I will reply to Mr. Berger Thank you Mr. DePierre I see it's now quarter past um, 11 then we just adjourn for 10 minutes and we will start again at 25 past 11 Thank you my lady uh, as the court pleases Thank you, Mr. DePier, for your submissions. Mr. Berger. Thank you, my lady. My lady, if I can start by dealing with one of the last issues that Mr. DePier raised, and that's the alleged unethical conduct on the part of, on my part and on the part of my legal team, uh, for not bringing a what he claims is a relevant judgment to this court's attention. Um, just by way of, of introduction, um, I was not counsel on that particular matter. My attorneys were involved in that matter. Um, but be that as it may, um, that judgment says nothing more than what the Manong judgment already says. And with the Manong judgment being an SCA authority, um, there is no need to bring every authority on a particular topic and put that before court where the second highest court in the land, which is binding on this court, has, has issued a, has made a judgment that, that deals with the, the issue um, conclusively. So there can be no basis for, for making the allegation that, that we were remiss in any way in not bringing that before the court. And in any event, what the ethical rule is, is that, is that a legal practitioner ordinarily applies to counsel um, if aware of a judgment that goes against it and then fails to bring that judgment to the court's attention, that is what's considered to be unethical conduct. Not where you fail to bring a judgment that is in your favor, where you've already brought higher authority that is also in your favor. And so with respect, um, to say that anyone was ambushed is is, is nonsense. Um, what I do find quite interesting is is 
Why? why on what on basis, what Mr. Dubia, makes, makes the submission? The because because it, goes it goes against, against the very argument, argument that, that he has put forward today, today and that, that is that there was no joinder of necessity. And yet, and yet the very the judgment, judgment that he says we should have put before this court in a similar matter says there was a joinder of necessity. So he can't have it both ways. He, he either must stand by his position that, um, that there was no joinder of necessity or, and, and then not consider cases such as these or, or he, he must make the point, but he can't have it both ways. Um, finally, on that point, if he has any concerns with the issue, and he is of the view that anyone in my legal team, including me, has acted unethically, then the appropriate um, course of action um, in, in such circumstances is either to lodge a complaint, is to lodge a complaint with our regulatory bodies, whether it's the LPC um, or, in my case, um, the, the Johannesburg Bar. Um, so that hopefully um, deals with that issue. If I can then move on to the issue of of um, representation, um, Mr. De Beer relies on a number of new cases which he didn't bring to this court's attention when the matter was first argued. The first are these set of cases, first in the High Court, it's the Kenmia Ndebele matter. Um, now I've read the High Court decision. And with and respect, with respect I've also read what came out of the Constitutional Court, court and, and it's, it's it's not a not judgment. judgment. It's a simple it's order, order uh, refusing um, um, leave to appeal. And, and leave, leave to appeal was brought by a number of applicants, applicants including, including um, um, Liberty, Liberty Fighters, Fighters Network. Network. Um, um, now, now, there is there nothing, nothing that, that one can, can read into a Constitutional Court order which simply dismisses leave to appeal, appeal when, when the very, very issue that Mr. De Beer um, uh, is concerned about was not the subject of a cross appeal. appeal. So, so one can't, can't try and read the tea leaves to, to read into in a simple one page, one page order, order a, that, the that the court considered the issues of representation, representation the court, the court um, uh, expressly um, the, the, court the court determined that Manong, that Manong is no longer no good law, law um, that um, Section 33.1 of the LPA um, somehow uh, overrules Manong. Manong. None, of, none that of that can be read into the Constitutional Court's one-page one order. order. And none, and of, none of that is contained in the High Court order. order. Um, um, the issue is simply not addressed not at all. And so with respect, we say that there is nothing in either of those judgments that 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 would give any higher court um, cause to reason to to overturn this court's decision. Um, what there is, with respect, are a series of judgments in the high court, um, all handed down after um, Section 33.1 of the Legal Practice Act came into force, and I believe it came into force on the 1st of November 2018, and I've identified, I've identified at least three High Court judgments, um, the, in which not, the court both referred to and applied Manon. Um, I, can, I can give you the citations for, the, for those cases. The first is a case called Metal Technics, PTY Limited versus RNS Truckery. And it's, and it's in square brackets, square brackets 2021 20, ZA GP PHC 487. There's another case BP Southern Africa versus KTA in square brackets 2022 ZA GP JHC 537. And that's in particular at paragraphs 28 to 29. And then the and final, final is a case um, um, called List Info Trading, trading um, uh, versus, I can't read my own writing, writing. something uh, hearing, hearing Center, center um, uh, in square brackets, brackets 2023 20, 20, ZAGP 
JHC 726. And these are all cases which rely on Manong um, or refer to Manong as the binding authority on the point. And so with respect, the coming into force of Section 33.1 of the Legal Practice Act does not change the, the legal position. Um, with a legal position that is so well established and that had been in place for years, um, one can't try and read in some kind of intention in that legislation to, subvert, to overturn that decision. If, if it were to be such that only in circumstances where a non-practitioner seeks to benefit or charge a fee, that, that, that such non-practitioner is not able to practice, then one would have found something like that in the LPC. Instead, what one sees in the LPC is, is that there's a concern um, that Parliament had that is being addressed of people who are not legal practitioners, who are not um, enrolled to practice and are holding themselves out to be um, legal practitioners and charging for their services. That's the mischief that that particular section sought to address. Um, one cannot interpret it to go beyond that, remedying that particular mischief and read in it some intention to overturn the binding authority of the SEA in Mano. And the three cases, and I, there, there may be more, I, I only got to three in the short time I had to prepare, um, but there are three cases which expressly recognize Manong as the binding authority on the question. So, in terms of representation, um, there, there is nothing there. The, the judgments, the other judgment, the Armour Technolo Technology System judgment, um, I had a brief look at the, the leave to appeal, and I see nothing in that. Um, and certainly nothing that Mr. De Beer referred to as being authority for saying that Manong is bad law. The fact that in any particular case a non-practitioner may have been recognized to represent a juristic entity is neither here nor there. The, the issue and the, the argument that Mr. De Beer put forward is that Manong is bad law um, and there's nothing in any of the cases upon which he relied which suggests, suggests that that, that is that that is, that that is so. so. It simply is an issue that has not been addressed in his cases, and in the cases to which I referred, uh, Manong has expressly been recognised as the binding authority. So that then dispenses with the issue on representation. The issue then of non-joinder. The The judgment upon which, the full court judgment upon which Mr. De Beer relies, um, which is with respect to judgment that he ought to have brought before this court much sooner, um, it itself relies on the judgment of the Judicial Service Commission versus Cape Bar Council. That's a decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal. The reference there is 2013. One, one SA law reports 170, 170 SEA, yeah, and that's, and that's a very, the very decision that we relied upon um, in our heads of argument um, in this matter um, for dealing with the issue of, of non-joinder. Um, that was the case, my lady, I don't know if you remember, it was, a dis it was where um, the Cape Bar Council was challenging the Judicial Service Commission's appointments to the Cape bench, um, where it had it had made certain appointments, but it had left I think one one vacancy open, and had not um, filled it, even though I think there were there were suitable candidates. And the challenge that was brought by the Cape Bar, Bar Council did not seek any relief against the judge, and I think that was Justice Henney, who had been um, appointed in that process. And so what the SEA had to consider was whether or not the failure of the applicants to cite 
the judge who had been appointed during that impugned process um, was a material non-joinder. And the court came to the conclusion there that he did not need to be cited because no relief was sought against him. His appointment would not, um, there would be no impact on his appointment by a decision of the court um, granting the applicant's relief. Um, and so in circumstances such as that, there was no need for him to be cited as a respondent um, because he was not, um, there was no direct impact on him. There was no direct legal effect on him of any order that, that was sought by the applicants. Um, so with respect, the full court decision in, in the Free State doesn't take us any further um, because it relies on JSC, on JSC versus, versus Cape Bar, Bar Council, Council, which makes, which makes it very clear that where you are seeking an order that has a direct, <coughs> direct <coughs> legal effect on a third party, <coughs> party and that party has not been cited, that's a material misjoined. And that's exactly, that's exactly what we had in this case, because the order that is being sought is an order um, to disclose documents that contain confidential and commercially sensitive information of third parties and the order that is sought is for that information to be handed over without being subject to any confidentiality regime um, simply for that to be made um, to be put into the public domain um, and with respect one cannot by any stretch of the imagination um, see um, that, that that kind, kind of, of an order, order that does that, that, that um, uh, does not have not any direct legal effect or direct impact, impact on the holders, holders of the registration of the certificates. certificates. And so, so in circumstances, circumstances such as this, this um, there was, was an obligation, obligation to, um, to join the, um, the, the, the companies in, in question. Um, um, the, fact the fact that the companies, that the companies knew, about knew about the application does not, not take, take us anywhere. anywhere. Um, um, they ought they to have been cited. It should not have been, been on them to have, to have to seek leave to intervene in a process, process in which they should have been cited up front. Right. Then, then the issue the of the Rule 30A1 notice. Now, now I have, I have looked, looked quite carefully, carefully at, at, at our papers, papers and, and it does, does appear that on one, one issue, issue which, which, which I submit, submit takes, takes us nowhere, but, but factually, factually it's important to bring this to the court's attention, attention that on one, one issue there is a single line in paragraph 38 of the answering answer affidavit that appears to be incorrect. incorrect. That's, that's the paragraph, paragraph that's, that's the line which talks about the initiation of other proceedings in terms of Rule 30A2 that was subsequently abandoned. That's the line in, on page 017-18 of, of on case lines. Um, it is there is there is no there is n it is an incorrect statement. Um, I do apologize for it being there. I don't know how it, it slipped in there. Um, it's obviously what what happened was that the, the con we conflated the withdrawal of the um, main application on the urge, on the unopposed role with a withdrawal of a Rule 30A2 application. Um, but we submit nothing turns on that. What is surprising, though, is that in reply, in reply, one would have expected Mr. De Beer to, Beer to say, but there, but was, there was no was such no application. And if you go to the reply dealing with paragraph 38, there's just a bold denial. But it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make the point that um, that there was no such um, application ever made. That's the paragraphs 42 to 44 of the reply at pages. 018-11 to 018-12 of, of case lines, um, but but there's nothing there um, denying that particular issue. But but it, it is incorrect the statement, um, and to that extent, um, we, we apologise for being there. We simply um, it, it it was put in an error. One can't 
as Mr. As De Beer does, does um, uh, impute any, any dishonesty on our part, part um, it, it's errors, errors do happen, happen from time, from time, to, time, time. to time. But the but real the issue, issue is, is, is that, that it takes us a moment. Because the Rule 30A1 notice that Mr. De Beer originally submitted was a notice calling for SAPRA to deliver the entire record in circumstances where it had delivered not a single page of the record. Subsequent to that, a record was delivered, albeit a redacted record and a record that, in Mr. De Beer's view was missing documents. Um, that was what concerned him, not the fact that the second time around, not the fact that we had, that we were failing to provide any record, but that the record provided, in his view, was an inadequate record. That's what his concern was. That's what he ought to have issued a Rule 30 A1 notice in respect of. One can't rely on a notice that applies to a different set of facts in a in subsequent um, where, where the facts have significantly changed. Um, he ought to have restarted the process. Um, so, with respect, the slight error in paragraph 38 of the answering affidavit, um, does, to which the court does refer in, the, in its judgment, doesn't take us anywhere um, because there was still an obligation on him to reissue a Rule 30A1 notice in changed circumstances. One can't simply assume that the circumstances were the same. And also, if one then looks at, at the Rule 30 a1 application uh, notice, it it goes into significantly more detail. Sorry, not the Rule 30 a1 notice. The the notice of motion in this application um, goes into significant detail that is not contained in the Rule 30 um, the Rule 30 a1 notice um, submitted months earlier. So with respect, we submit that there there is um, there is no case to be made on that. Then. Finally, Finally um, um, the issue, issue of, of the issue of costs. Of costs. Um, um, if I remember I correctly, correctly Biowatch, Biowatch was mentioned, mentioned once, once in the hearing, the hearing. and that and was that when, when I think your ladyship, your ladyship asked him, asked Mr. De Beer, um, why he had chosen not, not to cite, cite the respondents respondent in circumstances, circumstances where. where um, uh, Sapra's attorneys, attorneys had, had said to him, him please, please cite them, them. They, they need to be joined, joined. Um, and if and you join, join them, them and you don't seek any relief against, against us, us um, any other relief, we, 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 will, will, we will not oppose, not oppose um, a Rule 30A, 30A application, application that is brought. That is brought. He, then, he then, in court, court made the made point, the point that, that the reason, the reason why, why he didn't cite them was because of Biowatch, and that Biowatch only, because Biowatch only applies to organs of state and not to private parties, and it was out of fear of an adverse costs award that he, um, that they weren't cited. That was as much as what was said about Biowatch in, in, the, in the hearing in this matter. Um, there was nothing in the papers invoking Biowatch, there's nothing in his heads of argument invoking Biowatch. The only reference we could find to Biowatch in his papers is in his founding affidavit in the main application. But with respect, um, uh, my lady, that is not before you. What is before you are the, are the, are the founding papers, the answering papers, and the replying papers in this Rule 30A application, and those are silent on the issue of Biowatch. And so purely on, the, on that basis alone, um, Biowatch cannot be relied upon um, in these proceedings. But, but in any event, um, Biowatch is not a get out of jail free card. Um, the Constitutional Court in the Affordable Medicines case, um, that was a decision of the Constitutional Court, 2006, Volume 3, Essay Law Reports at page 247, and it's paragraph 138, where the court sets out um, the circumstances within which um, one can depart from the Biowatch rule. 
and it talks about saying that it's not a license to introduce, to institute frivolous or vexatious proceedings against the state. And secondly, and this is the part upon which we rely, that if a litigant is guilty of unacceptable behavior in relation to how it litigates, costs may be ordered. And so we submit that the, in circumstances where we pleaded with Mr. De Beer to cite the companies as respondents, he chose not to cite them, effectively compelling us to have to court, to come to court to, so that we don't um, fall foul of our our um, obligations, obligations under Section 34, 34 of the Medicines, Medicines Act, Act, and that's and the that's secrecy provision, provision. He, he forced us to come to come court, to court incurring, incurring the costs of opposing this application. this application. We made we clear made in that correspondence, correspondence that, that, as I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, if, if, if we were not we were cited not as respondents, as respondents um, we, if, if, we, if, we, if, we, if no, no substantive, substantive relief was sought against us, no cost no award was sought against, against us, and, and he cited, cited the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, companies that we that would have, we have not, not opposed. opposed. And so and it's so because of his own conduct, conduct, conduct his failure to recognize that he ought to have cited, cited them as respondents, as respondents that, that um, we, we came, came to court, court and it's and that, that behavior that means that he cannot rely on the protection of BioWatch, which, as I mentioned earlier, he did not invoke in any event. Uh, Milady, I just want to check if there's anything, anything else I, I need to, to add. Um, no, I don't. I don't think there is. Um, there is anything else. Um, sorry, sorry. One, one last thing. Um, um, in in Mr. De Beer's application for leave to appeal, right at the beginning, paragraphs two to three, he refers to. A, a judgment, a judgment um, um, and I'm going to I'm struggle with this pronunciation, pronunciation. Um, um, it's the Klinwa rule, a Klinwa versus, versus Volkswagen, X-I-N-W-A versus Volkswagen. It's reported at 2003, volume 4, essay 390 CC, and it's it's not clear um, he's referring to a Justice Henney. I don't know how this case fits in. He didn't rely on it today, um, but it it does appear, does appear that perhaps maybe that's that's, maybe that's, that's a, a reference, reference to, to, to other, other proceedings, proceedings. Um, um, but I, d I, I don't I know, and I've been unable, unable to, to, to deal with that, that um, um, in this judgment, judgment. In, 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 in this um, address. Um, finally, um, just on the, the issue that Mr. De Beer raised, he, he dealt with it to some extent, but that he, he raised in his notice of, of application for leave to appeal um, the the complaint that he lodged um, after um, the hearing in this matter um, none of those those issues are not, are not relevant to this application for leave to appeal if he wishes to um, take those issues forward he's welcome to do so in in, in other forums um, but it's not relevant to whether or not um, he has any prospects of success in the appeal and and whether um, this matter, matter. a leave to appeal ought to be granted. granted. So I had said so that, that was my final point. Uh, uh, there's one last one point, and that's the issue of should this court nevertheless decide to grant leave to, appeal, grant leave to appeal, appeal to which court, which court leave should, should excuse me, leave should be granted. granted. Um, um, in the application for leave to appeal, no case is made out as to why the matter should be sent to the Supreme Court of Appeal as opposed to the full court. In oral argument, um, um, Mr. De Beer has made the made point, point that, that he has relied on the second basis, basis upon which um, um, one ordinarily can can get leave to appeal, and that's um, um, where there's some, some other some other good other reason, reason. Um, um, some other compelling other reasons, reasons, such as conflicting judgments. judgments. Um, um, as I said, he that, that was not pleaded, pleaded and, and in any event, event um, the. the there is no, there are not conflicting judgments. There is a binding decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal in the Manong judgment, which remains good law, and there is no other reason. There is no, nothing else which departs from that um, and would require the SCA to, to reconsider that, that decision. And so with respect, we submit if leave to appeal were to be granted for any reason that ought to be granted to the full court.
Um, there's my lady our submissions. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Mr. De Beer. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Justice. Um, I'll try to be quick as possible. <coughs> just going to <coughs> uh, <coughs> I your pardon. I'm just going to address the uh, the, the specific newly addressed matters. Um, Mr. Berger uh, referred to uh, that the excuse for not introducing or referring to the COVID care matter was that apparently the non-judgment <coughs> addressed it already. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure where the non judgment would actually fit in there because all the parties, um, the, the, there was no question of representation in that specific aspect. So he might have then just cited the wrong case in that specific matter. But, however, what is relevant is that he indicated that he, it does not make sense why I would cite the non joined issue before uh, that, that was. Uh, raised by Justice Davis in that matter because I'm basically going to shoot ourselves in, in the foot. The reason for it and the reason why all the other cases um, referring to non-joinder is diff it's, it's different than our particular case. In all those cases, as far as can be determined, there has been no notification of whatsoever to, to the so-called interested parties. But in our case, they were away. Now, the definition of how, what, how does one define the term cite? They were supposed to be cited, they were supposed to be joined. Would the moment when a party is referred to in any way, and in the notice of motion of the specific Rule 50 A application, it was indicative that the notice of motion specifically cited them as interested parties. And they have been served with the documentation and then I also confirm again that that the participation in compiling the record itself they should have been part of that in any event so do you suddenly come and say that uh, this is an excuse and, and that is actually the uh, in this free state full full bench matter where um, the court has basically indicated that you, you cannot just come and and and, and shout non joinder if, if you have not not um, it, it's not to, to be taken um, it, it's all about that those people who are affected or possibly affected must know about those proceedings and that is what we did all the time um, in the high court rule specifically for example rule 46a um, although for example the occupiers of, of a property would be detrimentally affected if a rule 46 a application would be granted they seldom become part and, and, and parties to those those proceedings but they must be informed they must be know they must know that I as an occupier has got the right to intervene in this matter because my rights might be affected so even though they they are definitely interested parties because they might be evicted at the end of the day um, there are various instances where we notification is sufficient and in this particular case we submit that that they have been notified they are large corporations they could have joined these proceedings and they decided not to and um, then um, Mr. Berger referred to the um, the judge or the order of the concord in the Kenya matter and that cannot be proved that it, it's a stamp of approval of the proceedings in, in or the judgment of Kenya um, as as justice uh, as as Madam Justice would know that the in in the constitutional court they usually and and most often put in reasons in the order itself and then the order follows. So those are the reasons of the court that there was according to them no prospect of of success in the appeal and that was why it was dismissed. However, what is crucial is another constitutional court case. Um, it's it, it's the, the Kasu matter, which uh, Mr. Berger will most probably be familiar of. Uh, it's a Kusa versus Kao Ying Metal Industries and others. Uh, CCT 40 stroke 07 brackets, um, uh, square brackets 2008, ZACC 15. Now, in that specific case, um, 
Justice Rinkobu indicated in, uh, I believe, in paragraph um, 68 of that judgment, he said for the Constitutional Court, where a point of law is apparent on the papers, but the common approach of the parties proceeds on a wrong perception of what the law is, a court is not only entitled, but is in fact also obliged, better motto, to raise the point of law and require the parties to deal with it. Otherwise, the result would be a decision premised on an incorrect application of the law. Madam Justice, that one, one constitutional court case basically emphasized that if that matter was, was addressed by the eight or so judges of the constitutional court, they obviously had to have dealt with the papers and if they have seen this critical, critical problem of that, that um, how could Justice Modiba have allowed this to happen, they should have, and they, they are, were obliged on their own version of, 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 of practices to have raised that issue, and they have not. And in all of the cases that Mr. Berger referred to, where the Manon case was, was referred to, I, it would be interesting whether who argued those cases um, against a legal team uh, were, were they because the Manon uh, principle applies it means that a self-represented litigant a so-called lay litigant was on the other side receiving uh, had to face the, the court and also also the, the opponent's um, ex, uh, uh, experienced legal team so how could the answer is why, why is the Manon case still used that is, according to me, the most comfortable position for legal practitioners to oppose self-representation of a company or a legal entity. That is the, the model that is being used. And unfortunately, unless there is a self-represented like myself who is acquainted with the processes of the court and with the law, who can argue these matters and say, but were Section 33 of the LPC, for example, uh, considered in Manon and others. In the Manon case, um, interestingly, it was a matter raised mere and by the appeals, uh, the Court of Appeal itself. So the judges have suddenly come forward and said, but uh, something is strange here. So unfortunately, Madam Justice, you yourself um, were a legal practitioner, I believe, before. And unfortunately, for someone like us, specifically, Legal Liberty Fighters Network, we try to take the law to the grassroots level, trying to assist the people to get legal representation or assist them to do it themselves. Unfortunately, they don't have. They, uh, legal practitioners have been groomed in a particular way over the years to protect the profession. And I understand that. But what I'm saying is that this very matter opens a public interest case whereby the Supreme Court of Appeal who has dealt with Manon in 2009 now has the opportunity to reconsider their position to understand that it is not as easy for everyone to get access to justice. It is extremely difficult for non uh, 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 um, uh, voluntary associations like ours who do not have funders like the Open Liners or the Open Society Foundation like um, Af uh, AfriForum etc. We have to rely on what we can get to survive. We don't have nearly the, the, the finances at the end of the day to, to, to get attorneys on our side. Attorneys who are willing to act pro bono. Pro bono is, is, is totally romanticized in the sense that <coughs> pro bono usually stops, and I'm talking out of experience, within a half an hour after that person had a free half an hour consultation with an attorney. That is usually where pro bono stops. Thereafter, the legal team says that, well, we need to survive and we have to pay costs. So this is exactly where we are. We are not doing this because we just want to. Um, it's a it's a, a matter of necessity. Um, then um, the issue of uh, the free state non joining the case. Uh, in in that matter, uh, the cases are the the um, uh, court did 
include the, the Supreme Court of Appeal judgments, etc., uh, that Mr. Berger referred to. But when, when the entire judgment is read in context, then one would realize that in that specific cases also, in front of the Supreme Court of Appeal, there was no notification to the other party. So it was based on other principles. That is why the court came to the conclusion of the non-joinder. Then, um, Mr. Um, uh, th I need to thank Mr. Berger to admit that uh, they were wrong, um, and it was a, according to him a bona fide error that the opposing affidavit referred to um, to another process, uh, Rule 30A process. The fact is that there was not. So, uh, so that entire argument, that one one point that that you, Justice, um, um, Madam Justice, have relied on, and specifically indicated in the judgment that I cannot revive another one of, of uh, 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 one that was previously not not proceeded with. So that was your decision in that uh, that one aspect's case. Um, but now it turns out that there was no such case. So your judgment was unfortunately settled on wrong information presented to you. Uh, whether it was deliberate or just by bona fide, um, we will never know. But at the end of the day, it was wrong. Um, Mr. Berger also indicated that no, the, um, it would never have made a, a difference because of the fact that, that um, the, the first uh, rule referred to there was no record and then I had to because they have produced the record I should have then made another rule 30 a to say that you have not presented the full record but on which 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 ground which rule would that be based other than the very rule to say that you need to uh, produce your record there is no in between as I've indicated to say that if they produce part of it then you must, must, this will happen. It's all about, from the word go, you are supposed to give the full record, and for us to have given them another Rule 30A uh, notice, and then, as I've indicated previously, then another and another, it, it, I, I don't believe that that rule should be interpreted like that. It's about, they have not produced the record. Whether they have only partially produced it or so, they have not produced the record as was requested of them and expected of them. So that rule, that, that notice was more than sufficient, they had more than ample time to have addressed that. Um, then, uh, we want to, of at risk. Um, yes, Mr. in terms of the, of the cost order, um, I, I, I did mention that in the COVID care case, Justice Davis have extensively addressed the issue why he eventually um, made the, the normal cost order against them, where he would normally, if they would not have been so so stubborn and, and, and they, they, they followed real strange processes in that matter, he would not, uh, he would say, said, indicated that, that the bar would, watch principle would have applied. Um, and then Mr. Uh, Berger said, but there's no indication of the bar watch principle. And as far as I vividly can remember that I did argue the bar watch principle in particular on the hearing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. I would have mentioned that. Um, because, and, and the issue surrounding what was raised by Mr. Berger that um, that the uh, um, um, that, oh yes, like, uh, I, I indicated on the, at the hearing that we were afraid that is why we have not joined them. It's not a matter of being afraid as such. It is a matter of being cautious and to respect the processes of the court. The court rules specifically and the practices of the court specifically say that please only bring the relevant parties to the proceedings. Uh, we have seen in the COVID-19 uh, challenges uh, the past couple of years that people have brought uh, the president and the Corona Command Commission and the Minister of Health and whoever, a long list of respondents to court whereby it will, only one was necessary and that was the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. That was how our challenge of the COVID-19 regulations have also proceeded with. Only on one uh, respondent. So we have learned that when you need to take the entity that's responsible for the decision itself is the one that must be before court. If we have indicated the Minister of Health and 
who has clearly also have a direct interest in this there's no complaint that he is not here but we have also notified him um we we have brought only sabra to the to the court for review proceedings as i've indicated at the or <coughs> at the hearing there is surely numerous of people and institutions that could have been definite interested parties but that is why the court rules my provision for a rule 16a uh, notice to my provision to get the word out um, that these are proceedings that have to be watched and if it, it involves you you need to come to the party um, so they always had the opportunity to, to come to the party and they have not used that opportunity um, did they really expect Liberty Fighters Network, and this is the critical aspect why, why uh, SAPA also justifies the punitive cost order against us. They, there was no, uh, 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 phrases like frivolous and vexatious have been used by Mr. Berger. There was no, this court itself never in the judgment mentioned anything that we were frivolous or vexatious. There was no, 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 no indication that we did this intentionally. So the, the cost order at the end of the day respectfully does not justify the circumstances of the case. And why is this important? Because the cost order will literally be at the end of the day hundreds of thousands of rands and there is no way that any one of the applicants will be able to pay that which would mean, and it's not the, the, the court's problem at the end of the day, but unfortunately that we have to technically close our doors. Because if, if Liberty Fighters Network is currently milled with, uh, with a cost order of hundreds of thousands of rands, how will we ever be able to pay that if we already struggle to afford an attorney to come to court? How can we now suddenly go and, and basically fund the, the extensive um, two advocates and five attorneys on the side of SAPRA who has an unlimited state treasury? that they can, can, can utilize. Totally in cont contrast with what we are. And I am not saying that this court should pity us to, to say that, um, shame Mr. De Beer, um, Liberty Fighters Network, and maybe I need to come to your assistance in that regard. I'm not saying that. But the circumstances, when compared with a case like, for example, the COVID key matter before they, uh, Justice David, there was no indication. We were just certain that they we, we were certain that it wasn't necessary to physically proceed with a joinder application to again join them if they just simply have the ability to come to the party and become part of it. Why must we then physically go out and try to rectify by an application to invite them on a red carpet to come to court if, if they can just simply say, yeah, but our rights will be infringed, let us come to the party, they've got the resources, they would have had uh, senior counsel on this case very quickly, and they did not. Um, Madam Justice, this brings me to the end of, um, uh, of, of my argument. I just want to emphasize that, that there are definitely numerous points which we plead to this court justifies a uh, proper adjudication and I'm not saying that there was no proper adjudication on your side but this is the time in after 30 years of democracy where several people had to fight in person against the one after the other legal practitioner team for example and even the court which in the Manon case may have motorized the issue how, how can that ever be, an, uh, 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 be fair and after 30 years uh, from democracy be, be considered as, as fair towards the, um, the, the litigants and to the people who are every day in our courts we are faced with this problem. It needs to be addressed to get clarity on that, that my opinion is that because the law is applicable and to be benefit to all, um, all persons in terms of the constitution uh, equally uh, and it also applies to juristic persons uh, as the as far as it can be applied, I believe that on that one point, that it would only be fair that if the magistrate's court allows this to happen, I think after 30 years it is definitely the time for the superior courts to follow suit and make it uh, applicable 
to say that people who uh, directors and offices of uh, associations may represent that entity if it applies in the magistrate's court it can apply to all courts which is a unified court system thank you very much madam justice and uh, thank you very much for treating me with all the respect uh, at the previous hearing as well i really appreciate it it's not not coming to my side very often thank you mr dpier um mr berger mr dpier thank you very much for your submissions and um i have made my decision after listening to you and considering all that has been said and especially the fact that there were inaccurate facts that were advanced which i relied upon and the very serious nature of the issues before us which might seek better clarity i am granting the application for leave to appeal to the full court of the high court and the costs will be the costs in the appeal as the, uh, as the court pleases. Thank you. Court adjourned. Liberty Fighters Network. Liberty Fighters Network.